je suis très heureux euh, d'être euh, ici en, ce soir. Euh, malheureusement, euh, vous, pouvez, vous, vous pouvez voir mon, mon, mon accent est affreux. Euh, donc, euh, je, vais, je, je vais parler en anglais. Um, I'm going to argue tonight for, um, for, for animal rights. I think it's a, it's a very simple argument. I mean, the, the, the title was Animal Rights are No-Brainer, and that's, I think, basically what it is. Um, the case for animal rights can be established simply on the basis of, you know, two, I think, very uncontroversial uh, premises. And um, the, first, the, the, the first premise, the first sort of uh, assumption I'll make which I think is a very, you know, sort of very modest assumption, is, is that animals count morally. They have some kind of moral weight. I, I won't assume, I won't, I won't assume um, that they count as much as, as human beings or anything like that. I'll just assume that they have some kind of moral weight. Um, I'll explain why I think this, and I think, I, I think everybody pretty much has got to agree with that, uh, as, as we'll see. And the second assumption is this. I'm going to draw a distinction between what, what I'm going to call vital and uh, non-vital interests. And um, I'll explain what that distinction is. But the second assumption is that if you override the vital interests of something in order to further your own non-vital interests, then um, you're basically treating that person as if they do not count morally. Um, so so the, first, the first task. Uh, is, is basically to explain what these mean and why they're very, you know, pretty, pretty obvious uh, claims. Um, here, here's, here's a picture which I suppose could be interpreted in, in different ways. Um, the, guy with, the guy with the chainsaw, I assume, is, is chopping trees. He's not about to, to chop the dog, okay? Um, and, you know, Chopping down, t taking a chainsaw to a tree is, is, is one thing. And, um, you know, I'm not, it's not that I have anything against trees. I mean, some of, some of my best friends are trees. But, but um, there's a difference. There's a moral difference between taking a chainsaw to a tree and taking a chainsaw to, uh, to a dog. Um, the two are very different, morally speaking. And I, I know there's been a, a lot written lately about plant cognition, which we can talk about later if you like, but uh, basically I'm not convinced, okay? So I think we, we, we can, you know, th th this is something that, you know, taking a chainsaw to a tree is one thing, taking a chainsaw to a dog is, is quite another. I think that's something that everybody can pretty much agree on, okay? If you're not a psychopath or anything like that, okay? So, um, what this seems to show is that uh, if, if you think of the sort of the moral club as things that count morally, if you're in the club, then you count morally. If you're not in the club, then you don't. Then dogs are um, in the moral club. They count morally. Maybe they don't count, count as much as humans. That's, that's fine. But they're in, in some sense. Maybe not fully paid up members, but uh, they're in. And the reason seems to be that you know, dogs have interests in a way that um, trees, trees don't. Um, dogs can suffer or enjoy the things that happen to them, and trees, as far as we know, are completely oblivious to, to that. Bad things can happen to trees, things can destroy trees, but they don't consciously suffer these, these things. Dogs do, and that's why dogs are in a different kind of moral plane, a different moral stratum than uh, trees. So, dogs count morally in a way that trees uh, do not. That, I take it, is you know, a fairly um, uncontroversial uncontro assumption. Put in terms of the moral club, dogs are members of the moral club in a way that, um, in a way that trees aren't. The same is true, you know, animals in general Animals is a very large category, but animals in general are members of the moral club in a way that plants are not, because animals can consciously suffer or enjoy the things that, that happen to them. It seems a reasonably uncontroversial um, premise. 
philosophers have this expression which they use to sort of, I, I don't know why I'm talking about this, but I'm a philosopher, probably that's why. Philosophers have this sort of um, expression which they use to, to record this. They, they talk about moral patience, where something is a moral patient if it's um, basically a legitimate ob object of moral concern. It's something that should be taken into consideration when you're doing something that is going to affect it. Okay? Um, Animals are moral patients in this sense, and I think, you know, if, if, you know, everybody basically, I think, knows this. That's why we have laws prohibiting cruelty to animals and so on, where we don't have laws prohibiting cruelty to trees, although we might have laws against defacing them in various ways. Um, we recognize that animals can be the subjects of cruelty in a way that plants probably can't. Um, so that's the first assumption. I think it's, it's, you know, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty um, uncontroversial. The second, the second assumption is, is this. It's, it takes a bit, more, a bit more explaining, but if you override the vital interests of an individual in order to further your own non-vital interests, um, then that is the same, basically, as treating them as, as if they do not count uh, morally speaking. Um, this, this assumption is based on a distinction between what are, sometimes, what are usually called vital and non-vital interests, where um, a vital interest corresponds to, basically is, is an interest that corresponds to a need that must be met if the individual is to have a remotely satisfying life. Okay? Where, on the other hand, a non-vital interest corresponds to a need that does not necessarily need to be met if the individual is to have a satisfying life. I think, you know, we're all familiar with this distinction between the things that you really need in order for your life to go remotely well and things that you don't really need, but which nevertheless might be, you know, quite nice. Um, so, vital interests would be things like, you know, standard list life and health and liberty and pursuit of happiness, all that sort of stuff. Uh, bodily security, your life is not going to be, you know, go very well if you're constantly being under, if, if you're constantly under attack. Uh, shelter, food, water, and so on. Okay? Uh, those, 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 you know, those needs correspond to vital interests which you know, need to be satisfied if your life, I think, is going is to be remotely um, okay. Um, Non-vital interests, well, the standard examples would be things like money and possessions. Um, you know, it's assuming, assuming, a certain, uh, assuming a certain level is met. I mean, no one wants to spend a life panhandling or anything like that. But, uh, you know, I, th I think it would be implausible to say that once, once you've made your first billion, that, you know, you're, you're, it's essential to your future happiness that you make your next, you know. So I think we all agree that there's some point, you know, some cut-off point where... Um, Things like money and possessions become, um, in terms of your sort of you know overall life, unnecessary. Okay, so that's the distinction between vital and uh, and, and non-vital interests. Um, so, given that distinction, right, the the, the second assumption is 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 basically this: um, if you override the vital interests of something in order to further your own non-vital interests, whenever that happens, then you're basically treating that individual whose vital interests you've overridden as, as if they do not count morally. Um, to, to make this point graphic, consider, consider this sort of example. Um, a fine example of it, Italian engineering, the, the Ferrari 458 Italia. Um, suppose you wake up one day in, uh, you know, some sort of hospital-y-like environment uh, and find that someone has, you know, un unbeknownst to you, again, without your consent, uh, removed your kidneys. And um, you, you, this person comes and talks to you and explain, explains why they did it. And they say, well, yeah, I really needed this, this Ferrari 458 Italia. I mean, my, my future happiness just depends on having this, th th this machine. And... Um, of course, your kidneys actually wouldn't really sell for that much. They, it would barely make a dent in that price. But, uh, but that doesn't matter for the purposes of the, uh, the argument. So I think in those cir circumstances, you, you, could, you, know, um, you could regard with great uh, skepticism 
the idea that they, they have counted you morally. What they've done basically is overridden a vital interest of yours in having two functioning healthy kidneys um, in favor of a non-vital interest of theirs. They may, they may object, say, well, of course you can't morally. It's not like I did it for fun, but you know, whenever this sort of thing happens, when, 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 when a vital interest is overridden for the sake of a non-vital interest, that, I think, is, is usually tantamount to treating the unfortunate individual as, as if they do not count morally. So that's, that's the second assumption. We can't, we can't override vital interests in favor of non-vital interests. Um, if we do, then we're treating, we're treating the person whose interests we've overridden as if they do not count, uh, morally speaking. So, based on that, um, I think this is the basic, the basic argument for animal rights, which just rests on those, those two assumptions. Um, the first is that animals count morally, which I think everybody who doesn't think that taking a chainsaw to a living dog is okay is going to have to agree with, right? Um, they count morally because they have interests that matter consciously to them. They can consciously suffer or enjoy things that happen to them. Um, and, you know, some of these interests, some of their interests are going to be vital ones. Some of their interests are going to be ones which they need to satisfy if they're going to have a remotely decent uh, life. Now, the second, the second assumption comes in, to violate their vital interests in order to promote only non-vital interests of our own, is to treat them as if they don't count, morally speaking. But, you know, basic principle of morality, it's wrong to treat something that does count morally as if it doesn't count morally. Um, so, I mean, that is the definition of wrong, really, is basically treating something that counts morally as if it has no moral weight whatsoever. So, therefore, violating vital interests of animals to promote non-vital interests of ours is morally wrong. <clears throat> and I think the implication of that, the clear implication, is that many of the ways we currently treat animals involve violating the most vital interests in order to, in order to uh, promote our non-vital interests, many of the ways in which we treat, most of the ways in which we treat them, probably. Um, and therefore, the conclusion, well, many of the ways in which we uh, currently treat animals are morally wrong. So, take, um, that's, that's the basic argument. I mean, many arguments for animal rights turn on ideas of equality and things like that. And, um, I've, I've sort of looked at those arguments, and they are, they're, they're absolutely logically impeccable. Um, if, if there's something, you know, in, 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 in ethics or moral philosophy that counts as a knockdown argument, those arguments are knockdown arguments. But no one, for some reason, seems to believe them. So, I'm, so in this argument, I'm not assuming that animals count as much as we do or anything like that, because basically I don't need to assume that. All I need to assume is that they count to some degree. Um, so... Let's take one uh, sort of obvious example. Um, eating animals. Thanks to Stefan uh, Harnad for this, uh, this picture, actually. Um, I'm sorry? You sent it to me via email, so I'm thanking you. I'll thank her via you. Thank you. Um, eating animals. Something, you know, uh, almost everybody does. Uh, certainly seems to be incompatible with their, their vital interests, right? In, this, in, in, in at least two different ways. Um, first of all, they die, right? Well, you know, being alive, that seems to be a vital interest of anything, if anything is, right? I mean, if, for, for, for a variety of reasons, but, you know, whatever interest you have, you can't satisfy them unless you're alive. So being alive, well, that is, you know, 
a vital interest. So they, 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 they die, they always die. And they typically, I mean, not always, maybe, but typically, they live horrible lives. So, clearly, when we eat animals, we violate, we sacrifice some of their most vital interests uh, imaginable. So the question is, well, are there any compensating vital interests of humans that can sort of morally compensate for this sacrifice of the animal's vital interests? So, um, what interests, so, so the question is, though, what, what interests of humans are uh, at stake? And um, which is basically the question, well, what, what reasons are there for eating animals? And um, which basically, I think, divides into two. I mean, inter vital interests of humans can be at stake in two different ways. First of all, are there any vital human interests that are promoted by the eating of meat? And um, secondly, the flip side, are there any vital human interests which are sacrificed by, by the eating of meat? Um, so, eating meat uh, in favor, um, what, what, what have we got? Well, we've got pleasures of the palate, right? Um, which is undeniable, I think. I mean, some people claim not to, to like the taste of meat. Personally, I did, and I lie and I miss it, you know. But um, pleasures of the palate are, you know, one thing. Do they correspond to a vital interest of mine? Are they required for me to live a remotely satisfying life? Difficult to make that case, okay? Um, so, pleasures of the palate don't seem to be a vital interest of human beings. They're clearly not. Are there any um, other human interests? Um, well, w w one thing you often, you often hear is, well, health, you know? Um, Eating meat is required on health grounds. And if it were, if that were true, then eating meat would be a vital interest of human beings. Um, and on the argument I pre presented, nothing would count against eating meat if that were true. But um, it just doesn't seem to be true. I mean, this is the, this is the American Dietetic Association, which is, you know, the sort of premier body of nutrition experts in the USA, very, a sort of conservative body. So when they say things, you know, it's, it's, it's basically, I think as Jonathan Safran Fur put it, of the kind of, we at least know this sort of variety, right? So the American Dietetic Association say things like this, you know, well-planned vegetarian diets are appropriate for all individuals at all stages of the life cycle, including pregnancy, lactation, infancy, childhood, and adolescence, and for athletes. Um, so it's very difficult to make the case that eating meat is required on uh, health grounds. If it were, then it would be a vital interest, but unfortunately, uh, it's not. Um, we could also, I mean, look at the sort of flip side of this. I mean, here again is... We could ask this, are there any vital human interests uh, sacrificed by the eating of uh, meat? And here again is the, uh, the, the American Dietetic Association. Um, vegetarian diets are often associated with a number of health advantages, including lower blood cholesterol levels, lower risk of heart disease, lower blood pressure levels, and lower risk of hypertension and type 2 diabetes. Vegetarians tend to have lower body mass index and lower overall cancer rates. And it's not because there's meat it's in itself which is the problem, but here it's, it's the way we have sort of, uh, you know, we have raised uh, the sort of conditions in which we've raised them, the, uh, the sort of things we've fed them, the things we've injected into them, uh, are, are largely responsible for all, for all these sorts of problems. Um, so, it's difficult at the moment to make out a case for, um, on the one hand, for, for eating meat being in, in a vital human interest. Pleasures of the palate seems to be all we have. Um, and also, conversely, you know, there seem to be very good prudential reasons, reasons of prudence, reasons of health and things like that for not, 
for not eating meat. Um, these, these, these sorts of prudential reasons just um, keep getting bigger and bigger the more you sort of, uh, the, the more you, you, you look at them. I mean, here's an interesting, interesting fact. Antibiotics, as, as the father of two young children, um, I got started late, I, I, I realized that it's almost impossible. They have to be near death, demonstrably near death, in order for the pediatrician to prescribe them antibiotics. Right? And this is, this is the result of a directive of the American Pediatric Association to the, uh, basically prohibiting the distribution of antibiotics unless there is a clear and pressing need. Okay? So all avenues have to be exhausted. Why? Well, because of, you know, obviously increasing antibi antibiotic uh, resistance. Okay? Um, so, you know, the idea is, oh, the, all, these, all these careless people, they take these antibiotics, but they don't finish the course, and, and then microbes develop this sort of resistance because of our stupidity. That's the kind of standard story we get. But, I mean, the problem is that there's nearly six times as much antibiotics fed to <coughs> the animals we raise for food than there is given to uh, human beings. And this is not, I mean, still not, I think, uh, you know, the conditions are changing slightly, but Typically, still, this is not because the animals are sick, but it's to prevent them. So it's a non-therapeutic use of antibiotics. It's, it's, it's a use of antibiotics in the mode of uh, prevention of disease, which the animals will almost certainly get because of the horrible conditions in which they're, they're raised. Okay? So what happens? Well, you know, these antibiotics, which we've given animals just to make sure they don't get sick, get passed into the soil, they encounter microbes, and so on and so on and antibiotic resistance um, uh, you know, develops. So it's kind of ironic that you know, children would need uh, you know, to be near death in order to be prescribed antibiotics when animals get them just so they won't get sick, the animals we, we eat. Um, you know, the, people are talking today, there's been quite a lot written about the, you know, the age of antibiotics coming to, to an end, which it certainly seems to be. Um, unless certain drastic measures are taken, the primary cause is not irresponsible humans not taking their full course of antibiotics. It's the massive amounts of uh, antibiotics fed to the animals we, we intend to eat. Um, While well, we're still dealing with uh, you know, the issue of human health, um, pandemics, um, you know, Spanish flu, 80 to 100 million killed, uh, was, was, was a, basically a mutated form of bird flu. Um, the swine, swine flu, which, um, which I was delighted to contract when my second son was a week old, um, killed 18,000 people, you know, which, which is commonly taken to, to have originated from, uh, from an intensive pig facility in um, La Gloria, Mexico. And uh, things like birds and pigs, they're, they're very good at developing viruses which easily transmit to human beings. And you, 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 you do wonder what, what, um, you know, what, would, what sort of circumstance would cause us to change this. I mean, for, for example, if pigs developed Ebola and passed them to human beings, would this be enough to think, well, maybe raising pigs for food is not a good idea? Apparently not, because that's all already happened. Um, When you look at other factors which bear on sort of, you know, human, um, human <coughs> health and well-being, then there are also, you know, the obvious environmental factors. Um, people with large cars are sort of, um, you know, perhaps correctly, I don't know, attacked or vilified, um, but the animal, the, the animal husbandry industry um, produces more climate change emissions than the entire transport sector combined. That, the transport sector includes airplanes, trains, cars, buses, and so on. The entire transport sector combined produces roughly 13% of currently emitted greenhouse gases. The animal husbandry industry produces 18%. Um, I mean, just the news that vegan Hummer drivers have been waiting for, I'm sure, but uh, that's 
apparently the way it is. This, this, this is from a sort of Pew Commission report for the United Nations back in, in 2006. So if we're worried about climate change, then it's difficult to, um, to you know, condone, uh, I think, the eating of, um, eating of animals, at least in its current form. Um, I, I, I think you know, what, what one thing that many people concur on is that water shortages are going to be one of the leading causes of uh, one of the leading causes of geopolitical unrest in the 21st century. Um, one of the reasons that we have a problem is because of the animals we raise for food. So. It takes between 400 gallons, if you're talking about chickens, and 2,400 gallons of water to produce a pound of meat, which, you know, which compared to 25 gallons of water to produce a pound of meat, uh, of wheat, sorry, of meat, wheat. Um, so if, if, if you take seriously the idea, you know, the, the, the Aglala aquifer is drying up in the, sort of the, the, the Midwest, um, and presumably up here as well, uh, then, the predominant reason is the sort of uh, the fact that we are raising so many animals to to eat. Um, there are also other environmental issues between climate, besides climate change and uh, and, uh, and water issues. Um, this is, I think, a reasonably conservative calculation. Um, but it goes something like this. The animal husbandry, ha husbandry industry is responsible for 87,000 pounds of excrement per second. Right? So 87,000 pounds seems like a lot. Right? <laughs> um, Saffron Fur has a sort of nice you know, graphic image, as he usually does, about you dig this huge hole in the ground, and then you invite the populations of California and Texas to defecate and urinate in it um, in perpetuity. And that is pretty much what you've got from, from the animal husband, husbandry industry. And it's not as if we have, you know, in these sorts of situations, kind of um, complex or sophisticated drainage sewage systems associated with these plants. These just drain into the soil, which you know, results in things like microbial resistance and, 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 and things like that, okay? Um, other people are concerned about the environment in other ways. I mean, many people bemoan the fact that there's so little wilderness left, that so, 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 much, of, uh, so much of the world has been cultivated um, by, by humans. And you think, well, that's all right. We're, we're cultivating the earth to produce crops. But um, almost 40% of the earth's land mass is taken up with the growing of crops. But 70% of these crops are now fed to, to the animals we eat. The conversion ratio is not great. I mean, you need 16, 16 to 1, roughly, you know, 16 pounds of, 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 of plant matter to convert to 1 one um, pound of animal matter. So you can imagine how much less of the Earth's land mass would have to be taken up by farming if we didn't um, eat, eat animals. So I think yeah, the, the, the conclusion is, is, is pretty clear. And it's, 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 I don't think it's really contestable, you know, that but both on moral grounds and prudential grounds, um, eating eating animals is is just not um, it's just not it's, it's just stupid. I mean, it, mor morally, you know, it's 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 wrong because it involves treating something that does count morally, chainsaw dog, right? It does count morally? It involves treating them as, as if they don't count morally. Um, so morally, I think the you know, the case is, is is clear. But prudentially, also, if we're if we're concerned with our own welfare. Right then, um, the practice the, the practice of eating meat should be should be um, should be abandoned. Um, there, there there are more complex cases which I, I don't have slides for because I thought this would take longer than it did. But 
let, let, let's, let's take an example of um, you know, something which seems quite different, and it seems to many people quite different and, and quite reasonably so, um, experimenting on animals. Um, you think, well, okay, experimenting is, is, is all right. You know, there are vital human interests. We, we don't want to die from cancer or heart disease or whatever the, experiment, the experimentation is aimed at uh, averting, right? So this is a vital human interest. So maybe, maybe you know, research on animals is, uh, is okay. Um, but, I mean, there, there are interesting sort of, uh, there are interesting facts that kind of emerge when you sort of look at this more closely. I mean, for a start, I mean, a lot of the experimentation we do is, uh, is, is not really aimed at preserving human health and, and happiness and so on, but it's aimed at other, other things, okay? Making money, basically, having shiny, lustrous hair and so on, you know, and things like that. Um, it's kind of one of the sort of perversions of this whole business is that things which are not strictly medical, uh, medical issues become represented as medical issues in order to be allowed to do them in areas where, non, where, where cosmetic testing has been banned. So, I mean, no, when, I was a, when I was a teenager, I had, I had a bad case of acne. Um, very, very, very unpleasant. I was very unhappy. But I don't really think it was in my vital interest to be kind of acne-free, you know, for those horrible two years between 16 and 17 or whatever it was, right? But, um, Acne is now represented as, you know, a sort of uh, an urgent medical sort of condition which, which therefore justifies the, um, the uh, experimentation on animals. But more, 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 more pressingly, I suppose, um, the, the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration in the U.S., published a report back in 2004 called the Critical Pathway Report where it, it basically, it, it, it examined um, the success of animal experimentation in promoting vital um, medical research. And its results were, were, I think, quite shocking to everybody. Um, usually the, the sort of, the story goes like this. You, when you start off with a drug, then first of all, what you do is get a load of animals and experiment on them with it, right? You feed them vast quantities of it and things like that. That's called the sort of the, the sometimes called the preclinical phase, right? Phase zero, as it's sometimes called. And what the what the FDA, I mean, the FDA are no champions of animals, believe me, right? But um, what they found was that 92% of the drugs which passed this preclinical phase zero testing on animals failed subsequent tests, right? Um, 92 percent, which, which, you know, on the face, it doesn't seem to be a great sort of success rate. Um, worse, if you excluded the topical drugs, now we're talking about acne, basically, for most of them, right? If you exclude those, I mean, topical, topical medications, things you apply to the skin, they're not going to be the sort of things that, that, that cure the great killers like cancer and heart disease, right? So we're, we're talking, well, I think, largely cosmetic sort of issues, mostly. Uh, if you exclude those, then the, the, the failure rate was closer to 98%. Right? So, you know, what do you do? Um, and you find various defenders of, of, of uh, experimentation on animals who say, well, this is just the way things are, right? Okay, we should expect these sorts of failure rates. Uh, but interestingly, I mean, and, you know, to, to their credit, actually, where, where it's due, um, that wasn't the attitude adopted by the FDA who basically said, this is just, you know, this is ridiculous. This is unacceptable. Uh, and so, you know, gradually, I think this is an important step, you know, because the vast majority of animals used in these sorts of experiments are used in phase zero preclinical trials, okay? If you, if you incorporate them later in the process, as, as horrible as that may be, then the numbers are vastly reduced. So to their great credit, they say, well, this is just not acceptable. We need to look at other ways. And so, you know, you have the, 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 um, the National Cancer Institute, the NCI. They developed a series of um, human cell lines, uh, 59, and then eventually expanded to 60, which were, which were used to replace animals, not, 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 not testing as a whole, but in the preclinical phase. Um, and later, they, they developed various sorts of... Uh, another 100 cell lines for um, testing animals in the, um, for, for various things. I mean, one of the things we do, the sort of test animals on, is for um, 
things like carcinogenesis, carcinogenesis producing cancer, basically, okay, and pterogenicity, uh, producing de birth defects. And you think, well, okay, this sounds like a vital interest. Um, no one wants deformed babies, no one wants cancer, that, 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 that's fairly clear. But one of the things you've got to remember, I suppose, is that many of the products are not really essential to our sort of well-being anyway. I mean, we don't need yet another way to clean our oven or get shiny, lustrous locks. So um, part of the problem with, with, with uh, the sort of uh, pterogenicity and uh, carcinogenicity testing was that you get wildly divergent results. Okay? Um, so classic example would be, uh, you know, well, the, 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 there are various classic examples. We don't really need to go in, into those. Um, the basic idea, I think, is that there's a growing recognition, even amongst people who, um, who experiment on animals, that it's just a horribly ineffective way of doing so. So the way this ties into, the, the, it's, it's a horribly um, ineffective way of promoting human interests. Not because necessarily, not necessarily because there are no human vital interests at stake, but because experiment, experimenting on animals just does not promote uh, these interests in any sort of effective or realistic way. Um, so, I think I'll finish there, actually. I mean, this is, the basic, this is the, basic, the basic sort of argument, okay? We don't need to assume that animals count as much as we do. I suspect they do, but we don't need to assume that for the sake of argument, okay? All we need to assume is that they count at all, and the second assumption that um, sacrificing the vital interest of something in order to, to promote the non-vital interest of someone else is basically treating that person or individual as if they do not count morally. Um, that is, I think, the fundamental uh, core of, the, 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 of why it's, it's, it's morally wrong to, to, um, to, to do that to animals. Animals do count morally. When we, when we treat them uh, in the way we do, then we're treating them as if they don't count, and that's why it's, it's wrong. Thank you. <laughs>